Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. My name is Felix Shitkovich. And today, September 21st, 2022, I'm uh, honored to uh, be co presenting this webinar titled Pre Authorization Agreement in Debt Settlements Are They Illegal? with my colleague Jessica Livingston. And as always, for those of you who are returning listeners to our webinars, listen to us, to our podcast, and follow our uh, firm's newsletter and information. We appreciate you returning. Um, I see a lot of um, familiar, as I like to say, faces in the participants section. Um, and for those of you who are, are new, we look forward to your future participation and hope to meet you at our future webinars and in-person presentations. The subject matter today is quite interesting, and as most of you who know me, I tend to select subject matters for our webinars for issues that are of interest to not just our clients, but to those are in the industries we service and in the debt relief industry, the subject matter of whether or not pre-authorization agreements are legal or illegal. Uh, or permissible or not is a question that arises very often in conversations uh, with industry participants. And um, as we always have meetings with uh, our colleagues at the firm about what type of subject matter to cover for the debt relief industry participants, we think about issues that arise from time to time and perhaps could be a good rise to an interesting discussion. Um, so um, I hope you'll enjoy this webinar and let me um, let me turn it over to my colleague, Jessica Livingston, to introduce herself. Thanks, Felix. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Livingston. I recently joined the Shipkovich team as a partner. I lead the firm's Florida office. I uh, currently focus my practice on representing clients in the federal regulatory arena, mostly in the debt relief industry, um, as well as transactional services. And I think that this topic today is very interesting and I'm excited to also to co-host it. Fantastic, thanks, Jessica. Um, for those of you who will be attending a firm's regulatory workshop in Costa Mesa. Jessica will be in attendance. I'm going to really skip for, you know, a slide about me. I don't like to discuss it for those of you who know it, but I enjoy doing these webinars. I run a firm uh, that's headquartered in New York City, but with an office in Miami. And also we have a small office in London. In any case, uh, let me give a plug um, to our third annual firm's event this is a regulatory workshop for debt relief industry professionals. It will take place in Costa Mesa at the Avenue of the Arts Hotel, which is a beautiful uh, hotel, boutique hotel, right in the middle of Costa Mesa, close to all the highways and also the John Wayne Airport. Um, this is a third event, the first one we had in 2019, and unfortunately we couldn't do as a result of the pandemic in 2020, followed by second event in 2021, which drew about 120 participants, individuals from all over the country. And we had approximately 60 plus, I think we accounted for 62 companies in total attending. Um, this year, we have a fantastic event for various reasons. Um, first of all, it's a two-day event, not a one-day event that is filled with both educational and social functions. Um, we will have um, a keynote speaker, uh, which is uh, coming to us in person. We'll be traveling. He is um, a chief of staff of the market oversight at the CFPB. Uh, he will be presenting on November 7th as a keynote speaker. We also have exciting panels, and our, our agenda regularly gets updated. If you go to shipkovich.com and you click on the right top right hand called workshop, you will be able to see our updated agenda. And also, this is a firm's annual trip to the West Coast. So all of us come down and you'll be able to meet Jessica and Rosalie and Yvonne in person. And all of us will be presenting and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet you in person now that um, 
the pandemic is almost over or over. I'd like to say it's over, but it's a controversial thing these days. So I'll just say it's almost over. Um, in any case, hope to see you all in less than two months. Encourage you to attend, uh, whether or not you're on legal or compliance side or business side. It, it's really a fun-filled event. Anyway, let's move forward to the agenda. And what you have in front of you are topics for discussion today. We're going to talk about pre-authorization agreements. Are they legal or illegal, right? Which is it? Um, pre pre we're going to talk about pre-authorization agreements and TSA prohibition against upfront fees. Uh, we'll discuss authority to settle uh, and whether or not you need oral um, or written consent. How do you provide it? Uh, would a recorded call suffice? Power of attorney consideration uh, or limited power of attorney, but for the sake of discussing the agenda will limit it to power of attorney, right? I will discuss that. And then um, Jessica will also discuss cases alleging unlawful use of pre-authorization agreements. So um, let's move forward to what are pre-authorization agreements? Uh, pre-authorization agreements are generally, and I really made it very simple in front of you, they're limited power of attorneys, right? that are typically signed, that should be signed during the onboarding process in order to allow debt settlement companies, and particularly the negotiation team, um, in order to negotiate with creditors, right? So in order for a debt settlement company to appear and say, we represent Jane Smith or Joe Smith, we would like to, or he, you know, we, we're, we are representing their interest in hoping to uh, resolve their unsecured debt because of the financial difficulty. Um, one of the documents that is typically asked is, can you please show us that you have the right to do so? And that's what limited power of attorney document represents. I want to make a quick distinction that attorneys do not typically need LPOAs or power of attorneys. I can't tell you how often I have a chuckle when, um, not that I negotiate that, but if I ever, um, for some reason, from time to time, even in my practice, which is a corporate-based practice, I have people on the other side who are not attorneys and asking me to say, can you send me a power of attorney? And I said, I could send you a letter of representation. And they say, no, I need a power of attorney. And I said, that's not exactly how this works. I am an attorney and I could send you a letter of representation. I'm pretty sure for those of you who are attorneys on this webinar are probably smirking or laughing now because you probably have had those instances as well. But in any case, LPOAs are obviously not generally for, they're not for attorneys, they're for negotiation team. And in those documents, some boarding documents, and they vary from a debt settlement company to a debt settlement company, you know, they'll talk about percentage of debt that they promise to or hope to you know engage in negotiation with creditors. So the documents that I've personally seen, I mean, they vary. I mean, sometimes you have it as part of LPOA, sometimes you have it as part of customer agreement, and they'll basically discuss percentages. You wouldn't allow us to enter into a settlement of, I don't know, 40% or less, right? Or 50% or less. Um, and and uh, they agree that the client will agree to accept that settlement. Well, um, that's the reason for our webinar today, because pre-authorization agreements do not really allow you to do that, and there are restrictions in doing it. We're going to talk about restrictions in doing it. And for those of you who are listening and shaking their head, I don't agree. I hope you give us the benefit of the doubt to provide you the legal reasons why you cannot do that, and you will need to provide to have explicit consent for settlement. So I, I know I could, I could hear you saying, I've been doing this for many years, Felix, and I've done it for many years and my attorneys have told me so, but at least you made it this far, at least you give Jessica and me the opportunity to explain to you why you should rethink that what you're doing is correct. So again, pre-authorization agreements attempt to permit a debt settlement company to enter into a debt settlement for the terms that are authorized by the customer before the actual time of settlement. In other words, the customer agrees to some terms such as threshold percentage of debt to be settled, but does not execute an agreement with all terms of debt settlement, including the date or exact amount of the debt settlement. 
that pre-authorization agreements tend to be included as part of another legal document or contract. We talked about this, right? They, they could be part of LPOA, they could be part of a different contract. There's really no uniformity from from company to company. Um, so um, that's why it's important to point out that they could be kind of hidden in one of the documents. Oftentimes, many consumers who engage that settlement company uh, who are ex excited and eager to get started may overlook, oh, pardon the typo, uh, or misunderstand the pre-authorization agreement contained with a debt settlement agreement. Now, let's talk, let's jump right into the telemarketing sales rule. And for the purposes of this webinar, I think everybody who's joined us today could say that we can say TSR, okay? TSR, telemarketing sales rule. And what you have in front of you is section 310A51. Right, or some people like to say little i, but it's really one. Um, um, anyway, as you know, I always like to bring a little humor to 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 these webinars. Um, you know, sometimes listening to attorneys is is uh, you know kind of like speech listening to that um, nails on the chalkboard type of deal. So so yes, if I if I make fun of the little eyes or the ones, actually that's what they are. Forgive me. Anyway, let's read what we have in TSR section 310.4. It says, requesting receiving payment or fee or consideration of any debt settlement service until and unless, A, the seller or telemarketing, obviously seller, um, you know, in this case is debt settlement company. By the way, telemarketer could also, inter it could also include front ends or marketing companies, has negotiated, settled, reduced, or otherwise altered the terms of at least one debt, and then emphasis added, pursuant to a settlement agreement, debt management plan, or other such valid consideration, contractual agreement executed by the customer, right? So there has to be anything that you do in terms of um, modifying someone's debt, you're required to have something in writing, right? You need to have a contractual language. Now, let's continue. The TSR prohibits sellers and telemarketers from requesting or receiving payment for providing debt relief services until three requirements are met. If you actually go back to debtreliefwatch.com, which is our firm's site with uh, you know a lot of information, uh, including our past webinars, you could find a number of webinars we've done in the telemarketing sales rules. So for those of you who have listened and seen in the past, you know you probably will, will remember the, these three points. You have you must have negotiated, sell, reduce, or otherwise change the terms of at least one of customers' debts. I mean, that's a self-given, right? I mean, if you haven't negotiated, sell, or reduced, or change the terms of, a, of at least one debt, I mean, there's nothing to really discuss. You really haven't done much. That's is self-explanatory. But let's talk about the second point. Your customer must agree to the settlement agreement. Let's let let me let me before I read this. Your customer must agree to the settlement agreement. So if we just if, if we stop here before reading any further, and we think our, to ourselves, does the pre-authorization allow us to enter into an agreement if I do not have an agreement from the customer to enter into settlement? Meaning, if a client has agreed to allow me to settle for up to let's say forty percent of the balance, and I had I got him or her thirty-five percent of the agreement, no. In this specific instance, the customer did not agree to the settlement. That is not an agreement because the customer was not aware, right? So obviously, let's continue reading this. So debt management plan or the result reached with the creditor due to your, to your service. According to the TSR, the agreement from the creditor must be in writing. The agreement from the creditor must be in writing, right? When you onboard a client and you have them sign a pre-authorization form, an LPOA that discusses any type of percentages, that is not an agreement from the creditor in writing, okay? Although your customer may agree to it orally, emphasis at it. Let's take that one step further. And the oral agreement, if you're doing welcome calls, are not an express agreement to a settlement agreement. That's not a consent to a settlement agreement. Now, Quite often, I get calls and saying, well, we can't have a client, we can't have a client confirm this in written form, which, look, 
you know, let me be a little cynical. If a client knows how to use an email and if a client e-signed your contract and if a client, you know, has been emailing with you, I do not understand that why a client cannot agree to the settlement in uh, in a written form. But let's assume you have extraordinary circumstances and the client is very difficult to get a hold of and you finally got on the, you got this client on the on the phone and you said I have this deal for you and it's 35 cents in a dollar. Do you agree? Right? Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Okay. So now that is a that's a verbal consent, right? It was done orally. However, Obviously, they're best practices. You should, you know, if you are recording that call, you need to be mindful, you know, that the client is given prior notification. Um, most states require you to notify a consumer before recording the call. So if you do, you have that recording and that will satisfy the telemarketing sales rule, right? If that call is not recorded, best practice is to confirm that you had a conversation, send an email or letter saying we had a conversation such as date and you confirm the agree, right? And I also would allow a little bit of cool off period. If we don't hear from you in the next you know, 72 hours, please, uh, you know, you could rescind this offer. You don't have to do that by the way, but I would, I always encourage that. And then otherwise we deem that your, you know, uh, verbal confirmation is to accept that offer. So you always want to do that because I get the fact that sometimes chasing these consumers is not easy. I I, I get that, right? It's not an, you know, it's it's not easy to get them on the phone or have them respond to emails. But you do need to get that consent. However, let's distinguish it from the pre-authorization. The pre-authorization, the pre-authorization document, whatever it was, LPOA or document consent form, whatever it is, that is not an oral acceptance. To a settlement agreement. No, no. So if you are, if you are, if you believe you have authority to bind a client into accepting a settlement without actually confirming that when the settlement offer is made, you're a violation of TSR. And don't let anybody else fool you. It's very clear. It's right there. It's in front of your screen. Okay. You can't take your fee in advance by getting a customer to agree to a blanket pre-approval of any settlement you might be able to negotiate. That is directly from the telemarketing sales rule. They say that you can't take advance, you can't take a fee to basically giving a blanket pre-approval. Your customer must have made at least one payment to the creditor or debt collector as a result of the agreement you negotiated. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who will continue this conversation. Thanks, Felix. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into what Felix has already discussed. And I'll start with the TSR, the telemarketing sales rule. Um, according to the TSR, in order to collect a fee, providers, which are presumably debt relief companies, must have obtained a settlement or other alteration of a debt. Some of us might already have a pretty decent grasp on this point. At, um, on this point, however, the interesting restriction in the case of TSR is that not only must the provider obtain a valid contractual agreement between the consumer and the creditor or debt collector, but that agreement must also be executed by the customer. And this is where the problem with pre-authorization agreements arise. We're at the intersection of two key issues in the debt settlement area. One is fees for service. Two is the contract agency principles. Presumably a contractual agreement may be valid without the actual execution of the customer. If for example, um, the provider has been given proper authorization ahead of time to accept a given settlement. However, and you can go to the next slide, Felix, if you would. However, beware, in order to collect fees for service in the debt settlement space, the TSR specifies that the consumer must execute the specific agreement. So this means that a contract that's signed at the outset 
that specifies, for example, that any offer, like Felix was saying, that involves the payment of a certain amount will be deemed acceptable to the consumer is not sufficient to comply with the rule. And this is a very important point. Um, it's worth reiterating because providers presumably want to get paid and aren't working for free. So under the TSR, in order to collect fees, it's critical to understand that the contractual agreement for debt relief um, that's required under the TSR. I'm talking about the contractual agreement um, that, that, is, that has prohibitions under the TSR. Um, it comes with additional requirements outside of simple contract agency principles. The agreement itself must be signed by the customer. Now, the rule does permit, like Felix was saying, that a provider can obtain an oral or written execution of the agreement in order to allow providers to proceed efficiently. However, the required execution may not be the execution of a pre-authorization agreement. There may be issues that arise in terms of providing an oral execution, um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that the execution of the specific agreement to settle is what is required by the TSR prior to collecting fees for service. And we have, um, we have cases that will go over that in just a minute. Um, can you switch this slide, please? Yeah. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, why not obtain a power of attorney? You might be thinking a power of attorney might be a practical workaround to the TSR prohibition against the pre-authorization agreements. It's a mouthful because the power of attorney would provide express authority to, to bind the customer to an agreement or permit an execution of the agreement. But this is where, again, the issue with pre-authorization agreements under the TSR arises at the intersection of those two key issues in the debt settlement area, the collection of fees for service and contract agency principles. Under the contract agency principles, a power of attorney may be sufficient to bind the customer to an agreement. However, the primary objective here, again, in the debt relief space is to ensure that the collection of fees is permissible under the TSR. And that said, using a power of attorney is extra risky, in my opinion here because providers may find themselves in a situation where they have essentially provided a debt relief service, but are unable to lawfully collect their fees because the customer has not actually executed the specific agreement to settle a debt as required by the TSR prior to collection of fees. And um, at this point, I would turn it back over to Felix to see if he has anything else to add. Sure, thanks Jessica. So uh, th there are a couple of other points, two points that I want to make. First of all, while we are having significant focus on the application of consent and the lack of such consent in pre-authorization agreement in applying the telemarketing sales rule, uh, we obviously have to be mindful that outside of the TSR, there's a thing called the plaintiff's bar. And the plaintiff's bar obviously may or may not know about the telemarketing sales rule the plaintiff's bar, which, as you probably heard from our previous webinars, particularly the roundup that we did at the end of 2021, is sharp. The plaintiff's bar is sharpening their knives and going after both front ends and back ends for various violations under, you know, you know, Fair Credit Reporting Act, for instance. I mean, there have been a number of class actions that have been filed just in the past six months. Now. You're probably saying, how does this affect me? Because even if I'm not, even if I am violating TSR, how and why would the plaintiff's bar care? And the reason they care is because the ultimate question, right, is whether or not your settlements were in fact true settlements, whether in fact you had performed your obligation, whether in fact you unfairly deceived your client and potentially making them believe that they would be do acting on their best behalf, be, uh, on their behalf. And finally, did you actually have a binding settlement? You know, did you put my client in more peril? Did you put my client in more peril by not getting that express consent, that authorization? So that's the first point, right? And, and uh, 
you, you know, I when I have the pulse on the industry, I don't necessarily have it just on the regulatory side. I also look, we, we our firm does have, is involved in litigation, both directly and indirectly as general counsel. And so we always look at to see where the pulse is. And I could tell you the authorization, or the, 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 the pre-authorization agreements are becoming to be a matter of concern. Um, so just, you know, uh, you've been warned by Felix, you could say. So I'm letting you know that it is on the plaintiff's bar radar. The second point is, um, is this, this entire concept of power of attorney, which is unfortunately uh, is often ignored. The power of attorney is regulated on the state level, right? Believe it or not, that every state, every state in this country has its own laws regarding what is considered or deemed to be a proper power of attorney document. That's correct. And those requirements, or LPOA, limited power of attorney, but for the sake of this discussion, I'll say POA, the requirements could vary from state to state. They Some states may allow you to just sign without any witnesses or notary. Some states may require to have one or two witnesses to a power of attorney. Some states will, may require you to have a notarized power of attorney. And other states, believe it or not, I've actually did it you know, recently, recently, about a year ago, I had to do this. Uh, in, in the state of um, Florida, I, my attorney said that uh, the power of attorney that I gave to somebody else uh, required uh, not just um, uh, required not just uh, to have uh, you know notary notary um, signature and, uh, execution, but also two witnesses. So um, I urge you. There's one other thing that I want you to take away from this webinar, other than pre-authorization agreements are not legal, right? Obviously, if you've listened this far, you probably understand uh, where we're going with this. But the second thing is what you should do if you are a debt settlement company, if you're backhand, you you know, um, you need to go back and take a look to see whether your power of attorneys or LPOA documents are in fact complying with the respective state laws where you do business. Right? Believe me, that was going to be, because for the plaintiff's bar, there's not a TSR issue. This is an important point. Okay. Now, I'm turning it over to Jessica again. Thanks, Felix. So as Felix mentioned, there has been some recent litigation surrounding the usage of these pre-authorization agreements in the debt settlement space. And thank you for that slide. Uh, one case in particular, the recent Settle It case, is an example where the CFPB actually sued, alleging violations of the TSR, um, like we've been discussing, where pre-authorization agreements were used as a basis for collecting fees. These were the allegations. As you can see from the slide, it was alleged that Settle It used pre-authorization forms. And not only that, but it was also alleged that Settle It's paperwork stated to customers, you must approve all settlement offers to, uh, to our acceptance of any form uh, prior to, excuse me, prior to our acceptance of any form of compensation. And the paperwork allegedly went on to say, unless you have executed the attached pre-authorization form. So this complaint actually states the language from the pre-authorization form, the alleged pre-authorization form, um, which stated in part, I authorize settle it to settle any accounts with an offer less than or equal to 65% of the enrolled balance without separate written approval and or settlement authorization. And as I stated earlier, um, and Felix did as well, the TSR requires separate executed settlement authorization, which is specific to the contractual agreement to settle a debt. So I think it's safe to say this is really the crux of the allegations by the C CFPB. That said, I must say I'm not at liberty to discuss the merits of this case as it was ultimately settled prior to a judgment on the merits. And in the settlement, settle it 
does expressly state that it neither admits nor denies allegations. These are simply allegations that I'm sharing with you for informational purposes only. And yes, thank you. Um, but if we move on to count four, as you can see from count four, the CFPB has recently brought a lawsuit to allege violations of the TSR based on pre-authorization agreements. Um, specifically, if you go on to the next slide, in paragraph 94 of the complaint, it reads, settle its collection of fees based on consumers' pre-authorizations to settle or to accept settlement offers did not comply with the TSR. These are the allegations of the complaint. And in the next slide. And let me just quickly jump in. Sorry, yeah. Jessica. Yeah. I, I do think that this is a very good example. Obviously, this is a complaint, right? And now, obviously, like, like Jessica said, this was settled, uh, ironically, settle it and settled with the CFPB. Um, very kind of irony, right? Uh, um, the one of the things that I, you, you know, for those of you who are listening to this webinar is, yes, you do need two separate documents, and a pre-authorization document alone does not allow you to say that you have the proper consent in according to our marketing sales rules. So again, I'm, I'm saying this again, I'm rereading it again, just because you've done business all these years, or just because one of your, somebody, whoever it was, a friend, uh, you know, a spouse or a lawyer or a priest told you that pre authorization are sufficient. They're not, they're not. And and if you if you ignore it, you 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 know you you're willfully closing your eyes on the law. So let me let me move on to the next next slide. Thanks, Felix. This is count five. So an additional count within the same complaint. Um, if we look at count five, it's similarly alleged that settle it violated the TSR when it relied on the pre-authorization forms to settle consumers' debts. So this pretty much speaks for itself. I don't wanna to talk to the merits of the case because it was settled, um, but this is, um, it, it's just an example of, of litigation that's being brought by CFPB based on these pre-authorization agreements. And this is the consent, the consent final judgment. Uh, like I said, the case was ultimate, the case ultimately ended in a consent order, but take a look at the monetary provisions. Um, again, defendant neither admits nor denies the allegations in the complaint except as specified in the order. This is important to note. Uh, that said, defendant agreed to pay these amounts. I wanted to go over those amounts if that's okay. Oh, with sure. You. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's um, a good idea. Sure. More than, more than $640,000 in redress, which the order states represents the amount of performance fees collected by Settle It for settling certain named debts. And then as a civil penalty against, uh, again, this is a recent lawsuit brought by the CFPB, the defendant was ordered to pay $750,000 to the Bureau. And this type of litigation is just something to think about when it comes to the debt settlement space. And yeah, so, the next and final case I'm gonna discuss comes with a disclaimer. Uh, as it's an ongoing case, the discussion is being provided for informational purposes only, simply to show allegations that have been recently made with respect to pre-authorization agreements in the debt settlement space. Anyone can sue anyone for anything, whether there's merit to the allegations is another question. That said, our objective here is to simply use this document, the amended verified complaint, and to highlight the key aspects of the document in this case. Thank you. So based on the amended verified complaint, which was brought by an individual against an attorney, so not the CFPB, we can see examples of allegations that have been made in the debt settlement space. It was alleged that defendants had plaintiffs sign pre-authorization forms in his enrollment paperwork, and it was further alleged that defendants 
relied on those pre-authorization forms as authority to settle any accounts without separate written approval or recorded settlement authorization. So the amended verified complaint included allegations that defendants collection of the fees based on plaintiff's pre-authorization to accept the settlement offers did not comply with the TSR. These allegations are similar to those brought by the CFPB in the Settlet case we just discussed earlier. And okay, so then when we look at the language of the representation agreement attached to the complaint, we can see an example of a document that presumably supports the allegations. The, the, debt, uh, the debt reduction or resolution provision states, the services provided by the firm are considered legal services in an attempt to resolve or reduce client's debt. However, the provision also states upfront fees are considered the firm's retainer fee and deemed earned when received. Then the language in the provision further below at the bottom, um, which is redacted because we are just providing this for informational purposes only, this case is ongoing. It purports to appoint exclusive true and lawful attorney in fact. So on the face of this verified amended complaint, if the documents here support the allegations, then this would be another example of a document that has been recently alleged to violate the TSR as an improper pre-authorization agreement. And um, this this case is also another example of the recent rise in litigation surrounding pre-authorization agreements and based on the TSR's requirements surrounding the contractual agreement that's necessary to collect a fee for service. The, the contractual agreement required by the TSR has additional requirements outside of simple contract agency principles. That's, that's just a clear point to make. Thank you, Jessica. And, and that was really how we're wrapping up our presentation. Um, when you think about TSR and you think about whether or not what you're doing is compliant, you shouldn't just be checking the box, uh, complying with the regulators um, or appeasing the regulators. There's also the plaintiff's bar and private causes of action and litigation is expensive. In any case, uh, on the next slide, you have a list of our services, our firm services, more available at shipgivich.com. A final again plug for our event. Um, hope you can register tomorrow is actually, I forgot to say, is the last day for the early bird special. Um, you get $100 off your ticket. And uh, always, I encourage you to subscribe to our free newsletters and information on debtreliefwatch.com. On behalf of myself and the firm's colleagues and Jessica, thank you so much for being a listener to our webcast, our webinars, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.